Let's, let's turn to chapter 12 of Romans. And um, we're, we're going to look a little bit more of that. A, a little while ago, and I already know, we're going to stick, stick in verses 1 and 2, and I already know that you guys already know they for two verses probably by heart. And, uh, and you've heard this taught 100,000 times and, and that kind of thing. But, but, you know, there's always a little bit more that we can try to pick out of it. And a, a little while back, uh, it was a Saturday morning, Pastor had asked me to fill in <clears throat> kind of last minute. And, and I jumped off of, if you remember last time I was teaching, I was in Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and I jumped off that one up to chapter 12 for the men's study. And, you know, and then, and then when I taught back here in the sanctuary, we went back to chapter 2 again, and now we're going to go back to chapter 12. <clears throat> so, um, because something struck me as I was reading through that that hadn't struck me before, uh, as like always, every time you get into God's Word, there's a little something more that is revealed to you. And so anyways, I'm just going to try to share some of that with you tonight before we do communion. Okay. So chapter 12, Romans, verse 1. So before that, we're going to go to the prayer one more time. <laughs> so Lord, we do thank you for your graciousness to us. We thank you, Lord, for your dedication to us. Thank you for the strength that you give to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the mind of Christ. And we can make sense of all these things, even though it seems like the world is spinning out of control. And uh, things just don't seem to make sense. But, um, Lord, you have given us the mind to understand and, and to trust in you. It truly does appear to be the end of the age and things that are coming down. So, uh, Lord, just bless our service tonight. And as always, bless our time as we just meditate before you and commune with you tonight. It's in your precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and before I forget, um, this Sunday we have the VOM speaker. And so uh, we look forward to that. Uh, and we are going to be um, setting up for, you know, seating outside underneath pavilion, so weather permitting. Uh, if you want to bring them your own chair, a more comfortable chair, or if you want to sit out there, you can do that. Uh, we're doing that, obviously, because of the up uptick in COVID, and we want to try to, you know, generate a little more social distancing in here and allow people to sit outside and that kind of thing. So, um, but there you go. So look forward to this Sunday with the VOM. All right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. So he, he, he beseeches us, therefore, um, the, the therefore is because what he was talking about in chapter 11. Um, because of what I was talking about in chapter 11, basically God has blinded Israel in part so that they, um, so that he can basically bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and then through the gospel now coming to the Gentiles, he's going to use that to provoke Israel to jealousy to draw them back in. But, but through what he's doing, he's grafted the Gentiles into Israel, okay? And so he's saying, because of God's graciousness for that to bring the Gentiles to Christ, he says, I beseech you, therefore, by his mercies that you now, in response to that, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, because that is now your reasonable service. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. So we're going to look at three words here. We're going to look at the words conformed, we're going to look at transformed, and we're going to look at renewing. Those three words that are used here in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means to con basically to conform oneself, both mind and character. So you're conforming yourself, both your mind and your character, to somebody else's pattern. All right, that's what that means. You're conforming yourself to somebody else's pattern. All right? We are not to conform ourselves to this world. So being conformed in this context is a negative thing. So we don't want to be conformed. And we, as, we, as at least as when I've kind of gone through this in the past, I think about, I don't want to be conformed. I want to be transformed. Being conformed is a bad thing, right? We don't want to be conformed. Well, the word conformed isn't bad in itself. It's what you're being conformed to is what can be bad, okay? And so when he's saying, 
don't be conformed in this negative sense. He's saying, don't be conformed to the worldview. You know, this worldview that we live in. I just shared an article with you. We don't want to be conformed to nonsense like that. You know, to those people, that makes sense. To us, that doesn't make any sense at all. I hope it doesn't make any sense to you. Why would you kill someone or pay someone not to shoot somebody? That doesn't make any sense. But, they, they, you know, all the stuff that they're doing out in, in San Francisco doesn't seem to make sense. Um, none, nonetheless, that's in the negative context that we read this. You don't want to be conformed to this world. There's, uh, I looked at some of the other places in the New Testament where this word conformed is used. Another place where it's used in a negative context is in 1 Peter in chapter 1, in 13 to 16, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because as it is written, be holy, for I am holy." So two negative instances there. We don't want to be conformed to this world view. We don't want to be conformed to former lusts that may have you know, attracted us. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be conformed to those things. We don't want to align both our mind and our character with those things. We want to be transformed, right? But there's a couple places where conformed or several places where conformed is used in a positive sense. So you all know Romans 8, 28, Right? All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Verse 29 then says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. Conformed to what? To the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Obviously conformed in that context is a good thing. We want to be conformed to his son. So the word conformed isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? So if we uh, look at Philippians 3, you can, actually, you can actually turn to Philippians. We'll do that. Get everybody participating here. So I'm just not reading these things to you. You can read them as we go along. Philippians chapter 3. We'll go up to verse 8. Y'all there? Yep. Okay. Philippians 3, verse 8. He said, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Another good context. We want to be conformed to his death so that we can obtain the resurrection, right? If we drop on down to... Um, I think it was verse 20. Um, yeah, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, there's that word, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. So there's a, now another good use of it. We don't want to be conformed to this world but we do want to be conformed to him, right? We want, to, we want to be in mind and character like Christ, right? So that's, what we're, that's, that's our objective. So conformed in itself is not a bad thing. When we look at through here, we don't want to take that word and use conformed as a negative thing through all the scriptures. It's negative here in verse 2, but not everywhere. So we do not want to be conformed to this world, but what do we want to be? We want to be transformed. And transformed, you all know this because we've talked about this 100,000 times, uh, but we'll repeat it. Transform means to be metamorphosed, right? Okay, so that's the Greek word that's used here, metamorphosed. So we all know what metamorphosis is, right? It's being changed from one thing into another thing. And the probably most common, easiest analogy of that or example of that is 
a butterfly. Yeah, so like you think of a monarch butterfly. Have you ever seen the monarch caterpillar? <laughs> kind of an ugly little green thing, isn't it? So, uh, and, then, and then what does that do? It crawls up the stalk and weaves itself a cocoon. And then later, it comes out as this beautiful butterfly. I mean, gorgeous, one of the prettiest butterflies out there, right? Just a beautiful butterfly. And if you've ever seen the migration of the monarchs, it's a stunning thing to see. So, so we know through science that if you, this, this little ugly green thing is the same as this beautiful monarch, right? But if you take out our knowledge of science and someone said to you, they're the same, you'd go, <laughs> no, 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 no. That little ugly green thing is not the same as that beautiful monarch butterfly. But they are. They are the same. Except for one has been metamorphosed. One has been transformed. And the idea here is that the thing that was transformed looks so much unlike what it was that you can't even recognize that it was what it was before. That's what we're supposed to be like. That's what we're supposed to be like when we are transformed into the image of Christ Somebody should look at us and say, you aren't the same person. You know, someone that knew you, you know, BC, you would hope they would say, you're, there's something, you're not the same person. You don't look anything like what I remember before. You look like something completely different and hopefully more glorious. Um, so that's the idea of being transformed, right? Not conformed, mind and character, not conformed to this world, transformed into the image of Christ, looking nothing like what we looked like before. Okay, so that's word number two. By the renewing, right? By the renewing of your mind. Renewing, that word basically is renovation. Okay, the word, the Greek word that they translated into renewing basically means renovation. What's a renovation? Basically, that's it. The, the definition is a complete and total overhaul. So, you took something and you overhauled it into something else, but it's still the base of it's the same. Okay? So, you think about, think about something that you may have had or whatever, or you know of something that, you know, when it was first built, whether that be a building or an object or something, uh, when it was first built, it was probably, it was brand new. It was pristine condition. It was as good as it can get, right? And then what happens? Time. Time keeps ticking. Tick, 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 tick. And eventually that thing maybe starts getting neglected. It's not being upkept. We have the law of entropy, which means things are going to start deteriorating all on their own. You don't have to do anything. Just leave it alone. It's going to start falling apart, right? It's going to start deteriorating on its own because of this world that we live in. It's a toxic world, and it will start deteriorating. And you give it enough time, that thing kind of starts looking pretty bad. But it can be renewed. It can be renovated, right? And you can renovate it back to something new or something that looks new. So in the context of this, you're being transformed, you're being renewed, your mind's being renewed. And we know from other texts, you're being renewed by the washing of the water of the word, right? And by washing, being washed through the water of the word and, and, and engulfing yourself in this and saturating yourself in this, you will not be conforming yourself to the world. You'll be transforming yourself into the image of Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples and uh, analogies of things because I've, I've done some restorations. I've done some overhauls of some things. Um, many of you may know we built a large portion of our house. We also purchased a small little house, which was in pretty bad condition when we got it. And we spent quite a bit of time and quite a bit of effort to basically gut it and renew it and restore it, to renovate it. It didn't happen by itself. It took someone, it took somebody, namely us in that situation, it took effort, it took work. 
It just didn't happen on its own. Somebody had to interject, and you're going to see the spiritual application here, obviously. Someone had to interject energy into that renovation. All right. Now, I've also renovated a couple boats. One of them is a 1964 Boston Whaler. Um, I bought it a while back, and when I went to look at it, I just wanted to get a simple little fishing boat so I could take my son fishing. Didn't want to spend a whole lot of money. Found this Boston Whaler. Went to look at it. Frankie went with me, and she was like, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? So, you know, it's 1964. This is a 57-year-old boat, okay, which had been neglected. And I don't know how many people have owned this boat since 1964 prior to me, but I can guarantee you every one of them drilled a hole in it somewhere, okay, <laughs> because it was covered. It was littered with the holes from where people had mounted stuff. It had dings in it. It was messed up. It had holes. It, I mean, it was, Frankie was like, are you out of your mind? Are you, are you crazy? Are you really going to pull? Are you, you think we're going to be able to pull it home? Because the trailer was just as bad as the boat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I pulled that thing home and I went to work on it. And when I got done with it, it looked like it came off the showroom. It's a gorgeous, I wish I could show you a picture of it. It is absolutely beautiful. It is a beautiful boat. And every time I go out in that boat, people are like, oh my gosh. Look at that thing. It is gorgeous. You know, it's a classic old boat with a lot of wood in it, and it's pristine condition. All right? So that was one. Then somebody else I know got a boat. <clears throat> Wasn't a big boat, like 14, 15 foot or whatever it was. But they got taken. Okay? Somebody did something to this boat. Uh, and I don't, I don't really know what happened to it. I can speculate what happened to it. I can speculate that it was probably on the back of a pickup truck and it fell off while they were transi transitioning and are moving it, um, transiting, uh, or it fell off the trailer or whatever happened. I don't know. But, but what I do know after the fact was that the whole bottom of the boat was ripped out of it. And, and they put a Band-Aid on it. They basically covered it up with some epoxy, painted it, and sold it. And this person we know bought this boat. Took it to the lake several times. I'm not sure how many times. It, you know, the one time that, that we all know about when we were there was when the boat almost sunk um, because it, all the box, epoxy for the flexing started breaking apart and, and it started taking on water and then it started taking on water faster and faster and faster. This is Lake Jocassi. <laughs> They're out in the middle of the lake and the boat is literally taking on water that they ran it to ground as fast as they could and dumped it and ditched it on the ground before it actually sunk. And it took several people, I don't know how many guys got out there and lifted that thing and basically carried it back to the trailer and put it on the trailer because it, if you would have put it back in the water, it was going down. That's how bad it was. Um, so I said, well, let me take a look at it. Drug it to my house, took it off, turned it over, started looking at it, started busting off all this, the remainder of all this epoxy to come loose and discovered that the entire bottom of the boat was ripped off of it. Um, completely split, holes in it, brushed it all the way down. Okay, and there's, I gotta, I'm, I'm saying this because there's a spiritual application, okay? I'm not just telling you a story. <laughs> all right, so, so the whole bottom of this boat is completely ripped out of it, and I'm working out there, and I'm pus busting all the old epoxy off that was lathered on there to, to hide all this stuff. And my younger son, Jesse, is out there, and he's, he's helping me. And when we got down to pulling that stuff off and saw the bottom of that boat and the, and the holes that were at that thing and the bottom of it was completely ripped off the bottom of the keel, my son said, why are you messing with this? Why are you messing with this? Dad, this boat's gone. It's destroyed. It's gone. Just throw it away. And I looked at him and I said, you see what it is. I see what it can be. Completely different. You see what it is. I see what it can be. Now, aren't we glad? Aren't we glad that we have a God that doesn't see us as we are, but sees us as what we can be. The same person, but renewed. Transformed, conformed into his image. 
restoration. Now, he's, you're, you're going to catch the word here, he's the workman. It takes some effort, right? It takes some effort by the workman to fix it. We're not going to fix ourselves. That boat was not going to fix itself. It took effort. It took my effort to do it. We're not going to fix ourselves. It takes effort. But the workman knows how to fix the boat. God doesn't look at us and say, he's too far gone. Jesus doesn't look at, at the Father and say, Father, it's hopeless. It's lost. It's wrecked. It's destroyed. Just throw it away. God doesn't say that. And, you know, I, I know we wouldn't have to correct Jesus, right? <laughs> like I made the example to my son. But God doesn't look at what it is. God looks at what it can be. I can renew that. I can fix that. I don't care if you've got spiritual problems. I don't care if you've got emotional problems. I don't care if you've got illness problems. I don't care if you've lost somebody. I don't care if you're hurting for somebody. I don't care if you've got financial problems and woes. I don't care what you have. God says, I can fix that. I can fix that because he can and because he wants to. Now, here's the thing. We don't want this fake Christianity that comes along that says, well, just bring your problems to Jesus. He's going to make it all better. He's going to heal your marriage. He's going to take, he's going to take care of your financial problems. Just, just come. It's going to be all done, right? Because that's not really what he's interested in. He's not worried about fixing all those things. He's worrying about transforming you He's worrying about transforming your very, the very core of who you are. And he can use those things as his tools. The workman can use those things as his tools to accomplish the goal. Can he not? He can. And so he can use whatever it is that we're going through. And he said, he can say, watch out, son. Watch me transform that. Watch me renovate that. I can make it just as good as it was when it was new. And then you know what? When you take the boat to the dock, people are going to come out and go, wow, that thing is gorgeous. It's beautiful. Because that's what God can do to you. He can take you in your despair and your troubles <laughs> <laughs> and all the things you have going on, whether, like I said, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, whatever it is, he can take them and he can turn you into something beautiful. He can do it. He can do it through the renewing of your mind. By renovating our minds, we're transformed and we're conformed to his death so that we can be like his glorious image. Being transformed to his death doesn't sound real good sometimes, does it? But that's the tool that the workman uses. That can be the tools that the workman uses. Ephesians 2 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared before time for us in Christ Jesus. He's the workman. We are the workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works beforehand. The workman knows what he's doing. He knows how to renovate the boat. He knows how to make it beautiful and glorious. Getting there might not feel real good. You know, if I was a, if, if, if it was a living being, I can tell you that boat wouldn't have been real happy when I was ripping all that epoxy off of it. And I was taking it down and shredding it as far down as I could get to it to expose all the problems. Because if I didn't do that, 
it would have never gotten fixed. I could have put some new stuff on top of it and stopped it for a while. But you know what? Very shortly afterwards, it would have had the same problem. But that's not what I did. I ripped it down to the very bottom. I tore it apart, got it to where it was basically in the worst condition it could possibly be in, and then I started renovating. Sometimes that doesn't feel real good when God takes us through things like that. Takes us through some trials and hardships, and, but he does it to renovate us. We're going to go through a lot. I mean, like I said, things are they're crazy. They're crazy out there, and they're getting crazier. But God knows what he's doing, and he knows how to take his project and renovate it back to where it's new. His workmanship, what is that? Or his poem. Or his poem, his story, his masterpiece, his artwork. That's what he's doing. He's taking the canvas and he's going to renovate it. That's why we're here. One more part. I almost forgot. When I was doing that boat, I did the major overhaul. And I got it to where it was, okay, this thing is seaworthy. Well, you know, it was seaworthy. And the majority of it was fixed. It was, it was um, I, had, I had fixed all the, you know, the massive holes and the cracks and the breaks and all that. Um, and then I, I went to start painting the bottom of it with some new paint. And, uh, and, and when I put the p new paint on the bottom of the boat, this is just the, the actual under the waterline paint that I put on there. When I put that on there, some blemishes came out that I couldn't see before. There was a couple places on that boat that still had places that would have leaked water. They were blemishes that didn't present themselves until after the major overhaul. That's where we are, right? We might be, we may have gone through the major overhaul already. We get blemishes on us, don't we? Don't we get some cracks in us here and there? Don't we get some things that need, oops, that needs to be repaired. I don't think I want to put that back in the water yet until I fix that. You know, we can't just let that go on. We just can't, we just can't forget about that. We can't look the other way. Well, the major's done. The major majority of it's fixed. We can't just, no, no, we got to fix those blemishes. That's why we're here. That's why we're here, because we need to have our blemishes fixed. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to spend some time. We're going to come before God, come before Christ. We're going to remember what he did for us. And we're going to say, in all honesty, I know and you know that I've got blemishes. And they need to be fixed. You're the workman. He's the potter. We're the clay. We yield to what the potter wants to do. And he'll fix our blemishes. It's a lifelong process because we live in a toxic world and as soon as it goes back to being perfect, something's going to happen. That boat's going to bump up against the dock. It's going to run up on the rocks. It's going to break my heart <laughs> when it does. But then the workman's going to have to get back after it and go, I gotta fix that. We're gonna continue to have our blemishes until the day we leave this place. But we have a workman. I'll fix it. Come to me, I will fix your blemishes. Amen? So we'll close with this. Um, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. So we have to have our minds renewed. God's the workman. We have to keep ourselves in here, right? You heard at one time back we had a, a guy that we were kind of partnering with a little bit, and he always used the, the phrase, the, act, the gospel is action. It takes action on our part. Um, God's not going to just, you know, meld this into our brain. We've got to open it up and read it, right? Uh, if we want to have our minds renewed. And, and then when he does that, you know, we're renewed by having our minds washed. 
And we need to have our minds washed, washed over and over and over. Because the husband is supposed to wash the wife. We read the word, our husband's watching, washing his bride. And then what does he do? He presents us without spot, without wrinkle, holy, without blemish. He'll take away the blemishes. Renewed, renovated. That's our journey. Amen.